Okay, hello everyone. My name is Paul Lukassen and I work at the Swammerdam Institute of the UvA and I would like to tell you something about how stress affects our brain. And I think the best example I think is, is this one. I think we all have experienced uh, over the past year a very uh, strong influence of this virus in our daily lives. Uh, it has contained ourselves, it has made uh, such that we had to work at home, uh, we couldn't go out, we couldn't see others. And this has been perceived by many as a very uh, severe uh, period of stress with a lot of uncertainty about how the future will look. There's no control you have over that uh, future, whether you will have a job, whether you will have an income. And in fact, there's even a, a COVID-related stress syndrome described in which people uh, suffer from, from uncertainty about their income and a lot of anxiety uh, that also translates into different behavior towards others. However, stress is not a novel thing. It has been here uh, and with us uh, forever. I think also throughout our past and our evolutionary history, uh, stress has been there and it has allowed us to adapt to a changing environment and to a changing challenge. In this case, uh, a lion or another predator. And all of a sudden we had to change our behavior. We had to stop doing the things we were doing at that point. And we had to shift to moving our attention, moving our energy to running away from this uh, stressor and this uh, important uh, st challenge in our lives. And in that sense, I think uh, there's a lot of stress nowadays that is true. It is still ever present and we still have to pay attention. It is still beyond our control, uh, but it has changed its nature. It is not that we have to survive, uh, to, do, to deal with stress to survive. Um, there are many other types of stressors that come into place. And many of those stressors, like uh, the traffic jams we used to have, the workload we used to have, some of them actually have resolved uh, during COVID and they have disappeared more or less. Whereas other stressors have come into place of that one. And social uh, discussions, uh, stress at home, uh, still a lot of meetings, still a lot of workload. And for instance, the Zoom overload, I think, is experienced by many as very unpleasant. Now, the response you can have determines a lot on the type of stress that is there. And stress can differ a lot. You can have a very intense and very severe stress. It can be very mild. It can be physical, like the lion I, I showed you. But it can also be social or psychosocial. It can be very frequent, uh, with on your control coming back every week, or only once and then for a very long, severe time. Important aspects of stress are whether you can control it, whether you can predict it, and whether you are sensitive to it. There are people that like stress. They don't mind being exposed to stress. They can deal with it very well. And that is determined by your individual sensitivity as well. So, a lot of variation in how stress can affect, that can affect the body. And in either of these cases, uh, the body responds basically in the same way. Still, after a very long evolutionary history, it prepares our body and our brain to either fight, in this case, um, deal with the stressor that is there, deal with your opponent and try to make sure he gets out of the way so you can go on, or run away from it, like the zebra does here. Try to escape this predator, try to escape this stressor. And the third response, which is part of the fight, fright or flight response, is indeed the fact that you just hide and wait until it passes, like the rabbit does here if the fox walks by uh, several hundred meters away. In all these cases, um, there are quite a lot of effects on the body. Um, stress helps our body to focus all the energy on the things we have to do right now, and that is dealing with this stressor, like focusing on one of these three approaches I just explained. Generate all the energy you have, focus it on dealing with that stressor. Make sure there's more blood to the heart, to the muscle, to the lungs. Less blood, less attention, less energy to reproductive systems, less attention to the immune system. Those can wait, those can be suppressed, like the digestive system. And this is organized in the body by actually two hormonal systems. One of them is the adrenaline response that we all know when we are, let's say, scared by something or if you're nearly hit by a car while you try to cross the street. You feel your heart starts to pound, you feel your lungs start to breathe, you, a lot of air is going in and out your pupils dilate, all these stress responses are related to the adrenaline response. Acute, very strong uh, stress response. And all the energy comes available. And a little bit later, there's a second phase. There's a glucocorticoid response that's taking place from the adrenals. 
that are released into the body and they make sure that the energy levels are restored and that homeostasis is achieved again and that you can function again in a normal uh, way. So, in a way, an exposure to an acute stressor is often seen as good. It concentrates your energy on a lot of critical aspects and, in a way, it saves lives. For many, it is seen as the spice of life because they like it. They like a little bit of excitement and sometimes they take on these very stressful events like jumping off a bridge, uh, as this guy is doing over here, because he likes the rush, the adrenaline rush. You can imagine if stress goes on all the time and you're constantly suppressing your immune system, you're constantly generating energy, uh, you sort of end up in a kind of diabetic condition. And over time, this is exhausting. This is disturbing your hormonal balance. It is disturbing your, your normal balance with a lot of other hormones and factors in your body. And it is generating problems. And many people see it as the water damage during a fire. The fire is extinguished, but the damage by the water is still very much severe. And in a way, it is displayed in a graph like this. Too little stress is not good, and too much stress is also not good. So there's a sort of optimum in there that is helping you perform in the best possible way. And if it's a little bit too much, you run into problems. You can be suffering from a bore out, as they call it. But if it's way too much, then a burnout is uh, on its way. And indeed, in uh, conditions in which people have been exposed to chronic periods of stress that they couldn't control, there are very clear changes developing, like deficits in memory function, problems with concentrating, a lot of fatigue and also fear and anxiety. People sleep less well and also their immune system is suppressed and they can become very uh, sensitive to similar uh, simple infections. There are changes in the libido, there are changes in blood pressure, all after chronic stress. And in conditions like anxiety disorder, like burnout, like major depression or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, there are clear histories of chronic stress usually preceding that. So it's an important effect um, of stress hormones also on the brain. And one I think of the best examples is that a lot of emotional arousing events um, are very well remembered by many individuals, but also by society. And many people you talk to will remember where they were and what they were doing at the moment these uh, tragic events that are displayed here uh, took place. And they have remembered that location, that memory, uh, very vividly. And also the location and the time when it was happening. And this is not only applying to negative events or, or tragic events like these three ones on the left and upper panels, but also uh, very positive events, uh, very emotionally arousing positive events like your first kiss or the birth of a child. They are also very much uh, very well remembered. So these stress hormones help you adapt to make sure that a nasty experience or a positive experience is either promoted and reinforced in a way uh, by having effects on the brain and its memory system. And the memory system that's involved and that's very sensitive to stress in this case is the hippocampus, which you see here in red. It's part of the, of the limbic system and it's involved in emotional processing and spatial processing. And if you take it out, it looks a bit like a seahorse. And seahorse is in Latin, is hippocampus. And therefore the name is hippocampus of this structure. And it is a very unique structure. Uh, and why is it unique? It is unique because it not only is involved in learning and memory, it is also containing uh, stem cells, it's containing newborn neurons. This is one of the few regions in the brain in which new neurons are added also in adult individuals. And uh, you may wonder, are there really new neurons in the brain? And I wondered at the time as well, because when I was still a student, I was always taught that this was not possible. All the neurons, all the nerve cells in our brains are supposed to last a lifetime. And every one of them that you kill, if you drink, for instance, alcohol, is lost along the way. And the brain cannot regenerate, cannot make new neurons like the skin does or other parts of your body that usually completely regenerate and repair themselves itself if, uh, if that occurs, if damage occurs. And this was due to the finding by, by this important guy, uh, Raymond Icajal, who described a lot of the anatomy of the brain over 100 years ago. And he decided and he concluded actually that there's no uh, new formation possible in adult brains. 
And that has been a very popular uh, concept that has lasted for over 100 years. But one of the things that Cajal could not see was uh, the presence of stem cells. And within the adult brain, there are in many locations, a few at least, in which they are forming uh, new neurons. And they are seen over here. This is the hippocampus. You see on the left upper panel, you see the hippocampus with the two layered structural, two layers that are connected close to each other. And in this border zone in the, in the middle, there are many stem cells located that continue to proliferate. They form copies of themselves that start to migrate in the existing layer. And over time, after a few weeks, at least in rodents, we know that they form fully functional newborn neurons that are integrated into the existing adult circuit that was already there. They know how to find their way. And on the right lower panel, you see a lot of the connections they have made into the entire hippocampus. So these few cells that are being added every day in the hippocampus, this process is called neurogenesis, and it is very strongly affecting the hippocampus. Here you see the different stages. They go through proliferation, making more copies of themselves, migration, and eventually differentiation, becoming a new neuron, growing into a full, fully functional newborn cell in an adult system. Here you see examples of many new cells in the same layer of the hippocampus in, in the rodent. And you may wonder whether these cells are just there or whether they can also be stimulated or, or suppressed somehow. And there's been lots of research done into that aspect. And indeed, it is quite possible to stimulate uh, these cells and inhibit them by hormones, certain hormones, and also by environmental stimuli. And one of the strongest suppressors of this process, the strongest uh, inhibitors of neurogenesis, is exposure to stress. And on the left panel, you see here the number of newborn cells in a rodent uh, that is not experiencing any stress. And on the right, you see a strong reduction in the number of newborn cells in brown here uh, after stress. There are much less cells visible. You can also stimulate the process by housing animals, for instance, in an enriched environment, as it is called, in which there are many more toys and, and, and more uh, uh, roommates to play with. There's a running wheel, there's a constant changing of this setting of these cages. And this is generating a lot of newborn cells. It's forming many more uh, newborn neurons. And it also allows the animals to learn better and know uh, spatial orientation in a better way. You will see that there are many components of this enriched environment. And one of them is the exercise wheel, the running wheel. And if you take out only the running wheel, you basically get the same effect. Exposing animals, allowing animals to exercise, like many humans do, uh, generates much more neurogenesis. And it also improves the function of their circuit, improves cognition of that part of the brain. So those are remarkable findings, how environment is affecting brain function, also brain structure, in a very dynamic way. And there is, in addition to understanding how this is regulated, how the molecular processes are regulated, what is happening underneath, which genes are involved, there's also a lot of interest in how you can use this capacity and what could these stem cells do? Could we recruit their properties? Could we use their adaptation also to regions, for instance, when there are uh, cells lost, or in which regions in which cells are damaged and neurons are gone, like in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. And indeed, there's a lot of uh, discussion and a lot of studies done in the field in understanding stem cell biology, understanding how these cells are regulated. What are the triggers that they listen to? What are the factors that activate them that turn them on or turn them off? And one of the approaches that many labs have taken recently is to use induce pluripotent stem cells and organoids and take adult cells from an individual. This can be a human. And you de-differentiate cells from their skin. Uh, for instance, you de-differentiate and then push them back, so to say, in a, in a stem cell stage. And you then control their further development in the dish and you let them grow into uh, small brains like you see over here. And this allows you to study the very first phases of brain development, which is hard to do, for instance, in humans. But you can now study that in a dish, and you can see what is affecting that development. What is the effect of certain pharmaca, of, of nicotine, or of stress hormones? How is that interfering with the developing network as we go along? Also, you can try to use stem cells and 
implant them in the brain and see if you can use them to repair the brain. You see that on the left there is damage on one part and you see instruction or you see implantation of stem cells that are wiring the brain that are connecting to a lot of other cells. And this is uh, done a lot also in rodents. And for humans, of course, that's a picture on the right. It's much more complex and this will take a long while. So in summary, in the adult brain, there are stem cells that generate and form new neurons in many species. It has been shown in rodents, monkeys, and also in humans. These cells uh, contribute to the function of, for instance, the hippocampus, and they help the network work better. They are regulated by hormones, like I mentioned stress hormones, but there are also other hormones that modulate the numbers of these newborn cells, and also environmental stimuli, like exercise or enrichment, that do the same, but then in the opposite way. It is, like I mentioned, linked to brain function. More neurogenesis is commonly associated with better function of the network in which these cells are housed. And this is a very interesting feature of the brain. It's a property that is there just to be studied. It is happening in real life and it's very important to understand how the brain can adapt only in a few regions of the brain its structural plasticity in response to, for instance, learning and memory or, for instance, this damage as it occurs during diseases. So for the future, I think this will be a very important field uh, to continue. And it at least is a very exciting field uh, for me to work in. So with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I've given you hopefully uh, some insight into some of the work that's ongoing in uh, the Swamadam Institute in the neuroscience groups. Thank you very much.